Father God, I just uh, want to come before you now, Lord, and pray that you bless this time. Please uh, bless this Bible study. Lord, uh, I don't know who may come across it, but I pray that uh, it would help someone, Lord. That's, that's all I can really pray, Father, that your words from the Bible would encourage and inspire someone no matter where they are, no matter where they're at, no matter what they're going through, Father, be it a believer or a, no a non-believer. Um, the Bible says your word does not return void, Father. So I just pray that you use this stream um, to reach people. And I just also want to pray, God, for, for encouragement, strength, courage, um, for my viewers, anyone who comes and watches this. And uh, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would be with us, be with me, and uh, use me, Lord, to speak the truth and to read from the Word of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, tonight we're going to go to the Old Testament. We're going to go to the book of Ezra, and I'm going to touch on a few key points. Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. And I want to read something from Wikipedia, actually about uh, King Cyrus to give us like some history. Cyrus II of Persia, commonly known as Cyrus the Great, was the founder of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. To the Greeks, he was known as Cyrus the Elder. Cyrus was particular, particularly renowned among contemporary scholars because of his habitual policy of respecting people's customs and religions in the land that he conquered. He was influential in developing the system of a central administration at Passa Grade to govern the Achaemenid. Achaemenid Empire's border satraps, which worked for the profit of both rulers and subjects. Following the Achaemenid conquest of Babylon, Cyrus issued the Edict of Restoration in which he authorized and encouraged the return of the Jewish people to what had been the kingdom of Judah, officially ending the Babylonian captivity. He is mentioned in the Hebrew Bible and left a lasting legacy on Judaism due to his role in facilitating the return to Zion a migratory event in which the Jews returned to the land of Israel following Cyrus's establishment of Yehud Medin, Medinata and subsequently rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem, which had been destroyed by the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem. According to chapter 45, verse 1 of the book of Isaiah, Cyrus was anointed by Yahweh for his task as a biblical Messiah. He is the only non-Jewish figure to be revered in this capacity. So back to this, what he wrote says, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem, and whoever is left... In any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the fathers, houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all whose spirits of God had moved, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with precious things besides all that was willingly offered. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put in the temple of his gods. All right, so basically... The Jews um, previously had been captured and conquered by King Nebuchadnezzar, as it says here. And King Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the Jewish temple 
and took all the articles of uh, gold and silver from the temple and put it into his kingdom. And now what I just read is we flash forward and now the king of Persia, King Cyrus, is telling the Jews that they are allowed to go back and rebuild the temple. For me, this is this spoke to me um, in my personal walk and what I'm going through in my personal life. And this is like in the Old Testament, this theme occurs often. But Babylon, you know, is, is a defeat for the Jews, you know, and they're living in captivity. And this is often associated as a metaphor for sin in in our lives you know when, when we come to god and we start to like understand sin and, and how it works but you know sin is talked about as being in bondage or being in captivity um earlier in the old testament this same exact theme is occurring when uh the jewish people are enslaved by um the egyptian pharaoh you know and they're the the hebrews are the Jews, the Hebrews, um, they're, they're being enslaved by Pharaoh, right? And they're their servants. And, uh, you know, a lot of us believers, non-believers in general have heard of Moses, but Moses is the one who brings those people out of captivity. And that story's in the book of Exodus. Okay. So we see this like mirror, mirror image of what's going on and what I'm reading tonight. So flash forward. Again, the Jewish temples destroyed. The Jews are taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, they they're taken to Babylon, and they they live there um, for actually I don't know how long. Uh, let's Google that. Um, among those who accept the tradition, Jeremiah twenty nine ten, that the exile lasted seventy years. Some choose the date six oh eight to five thirty eight B.C. Others five eighty six to about five sixteen. The year when they rebuilt the year when the rebuilt temple was dedicated in Jerusalem. Okay, so 70 years about. Okay. And now we're flashing forward. Now King Cyrus of Persia is the one in control. And he tells the Jews, like it says here in verse two, thus says Cyrus, King of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So when we start to gain a knowledge of Christ, when we become believers, God wants to take us out of exile. God wants to take us out of our sin. All right. The Bible says that our sin separates us from God. And in my personal walk, in the life I've lived, I know firsthand that when I turn my back on God, my life goes awry, to say the least. So... The Jews are being allowed to go back and be, rebuild their temple in Jerusalem um, by the order of King Cyrus, which for us, we can take, and there's a lot of stuff we can take from this, but what I'm focusing on is the Lord calls us out of our captivity. Okay. And that's a good thing. That's an awesome thing, man. When your eyes are opened and you realize that you're a sinner in need of a savior, and you realize that Jesus is that savior, it is life changing. And it's in a, it's a spiritual, your eyes are open spiritually, your ears are open spiritually, and you start to understand the, the spiritual importance of life, who God is, what God did for humanity. Um, and you start to come out of bondage. I'm going to jump to chapter three, verse one. And when the seventh month had come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, the son of Jezodak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren arose and built the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of of those countries they set the altar on its bases and they offered burnt offerings on it to the lord both mor the morning and the evening burnt offerings i want to highlight this verse though fear had co come upon them because of the people of those countries they set the altar on its bases and they offered burnt offerings on it when we come out of our sin there's a change that happens 
And the people in your life who are non-believers are going to think like, that's weird. They're going to think you're weird, you know, straight up. They're going to think you're weird. They're going to think maybe, oh no, you're in a cult. You know, they're going to think if they don't believe, they don't see it like you see it now. They don't see it as a believer. Um, and even here, they're, they're allowed to go back to Jerusalem. They're allowed to start living together again. They're allowed to do their Jewish thing. You know, they're allowed to carry out the, the law of Moses, like it said here to offer burnt offerings on it as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And it says verse three. So chapter three, verse three, though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries. So when you start to follow the Lord, you're going to be attacked by fear. You are going to be tested. You are going to be thinking, uh Oh, what do you know? I'm gonna have to tell my mom and dad that I'm Christian, or I'm gonna have to tell my girlfriend or my wife or my kids or the guys at work or the girls at work or my close best friends, you know what I mean? And they're not Christian and they're going to think like, okay, that's weird. You know, Oh, you're going to church now. Okay. You're a holy roller now or whatever. Um, but just like these, the Jews in this example, they still set up their altars on its bases. They offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening burnt offerings. So they, they still did it, even though they were scared by all the foreign nations that were surrounding them. Okay. <clears throat> so I wanted to point that out, that at times following Christ is scary. At times you're going to be tested or feel peer pressure from the world to hold your tongue or uh, I don't want to tell them I'm a Christian. I, I, you know, I don't know what they'll think of me. And <clears throat> I don't want to stand up for the Lord or for what's right because all these people are, you know, I don't know. They're doing, let's say they're doing something immoral or unethical or breaking the rules at work. And you're like, Hey, I'm, you know, I want to do the right thing. I'm a Christian. I don't want to participate in that. You know, there's the peer pressure that everyone's going to turn on you. Cause Oh, you're the you're the odd man out here. We are, we have this good thing going for us. And of course, because of your belief and, Oh, you're a Christian, whatever people think you might have that pressure to not stand up for what's right, you know, but I want to encourage you that this is what this experience is of life. Um, doing the right thing is the right thing to do. That's why God has the laws and the rules he has. He wants mankind to live in goodness. And again, it's our sin nature to want to rebel and not do that. And we struggle with it as humans. Ezra chapter three, verse 10. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph with symbols to praise the Lord, according to the ordinance of King, uh, ordinance of David, King of Israel. And they sang responsively praising and giving thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy so that all, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people for the people shouted with a loud shout and the sound was heard of far off. When you build a strong, sturdy building, that's going to stand right. And this goes in modern day construction, ancient construction. The first thing you have to build is a foundation, right? It's the thing that's going to hold the house up for years and years to come, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years. Um, and that's what the Lord does in our lives. As believers, he starts laying the spiritual foundation of our life and what we're going to stand on. Okay. And anything apart from God is building your house on sand. The Bible says that that's a scripture verse, right? Um, for those of us who believe we're, we're building our lives on a rock. It's a firm foundation that we can stand on during the storms of life. You know, the metaphor of a home or a house. You have to have a solid foundation, all right? And then God start, starts building that house with your life, um, a sturdy, good, strong house that provides shelter and protection, you know? Um, but without the Lord, the Bible says you're building your house on sand, right? And if you were to literally build a house on sand, 
a house on stand sand doesn't stand for very long, right? It's only a matter of time that it's going to collapse because it doesn't have a foundation. In these verses, we're seeing the people rejoicing, right? And we're seeing actually it says some of the old people are actually mourning because this is reminding them of the first temple. Okay, so when the Jews got captured by King Nebuchadnezzar, that was their first temple. And this is reminding the older people, the older generation of that that failure in Jewish history when the first temple got destroyed, right? And so we jump to verse 13, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout and the sound was heard afar off. Okay, and <clears throat> again, back to this, this metaphor of sin in our lives. There's times in our lives as, as we walk with the Lord that we're having victory. Um, we're obeying him. We're going to church. We're reading the word for ourselves. We're, we're, we're seeking the Lord. We're praying to him. We're working on cutting out sin from our life or a sin that we're struggling with. We're having victory in that, you know, we're doing better. We're not living in some flat out terrible sin, like premarital sex or addiction and our lives are going good and the Lord's building that house in our lives. Um, but we're all human and we're all sinners and it's called, you know, you might've heard this before, but it's a popular term in Christianity. Um, I call it Christianese, you know, it's a Christianese word, but you hear about a backslidden Christian, meaning someone came to the Lord, they were on fire for God. They were following God, they they were doing good, you know, they were working on themselves, they were working on their relationship with God, and then something happens, and they go back to their sin, right? And either whatever house or foundation that the Lord had been laying in their lives, either that house, you know, it gets, it stops getting worked on, right? Because you go back to the world, you go back to faithlessness, you stop praying, you stop seeking God. And, you know, that house is either just the construction on the house of your life is stopped or flat out that house is going to get destroyed because you're building a, a false house again. Okay. And this is, um, this is common. I've seen it. <laughs> it's been a huge problem in my life. First of all, Archmages. Yes, dude. Welcome, welcome to real Bible study TV, the hottest in Bible study technology. <laughs> um, but it struck me this verse about the old people crying, because as we start to get to know the Lord and, and love the Lord, we mourn for the sin in our lives. We mourn for the bad buildings that we built. You know what I mean? We, we mourn for the destroyed building. Um, if you're backslidden, you might remember a time when things were going good with you and God and you were following God. <clears throat> and then again, you return to your sin and then you come back to the Lord. All right. Um, and you, you're mourning for that failure. You're mourning that you went back to the world. You're mourning that you went back to the old you. You're mourning for that because if you're truly a believer, if you truly believe in Jesus, if you truly accepted him and you believe that, and you believe the word of God, sin and your struggle with sin is never going to set well with you. It's never going to set well with you because you know that that's not what God wants for you. You know that that's going against God. You know that God has a better plan for your life. Um, and do we all do it? We all, we all do it. We have moments of growth. We have moments of not growth, whatever. And it can vary. It can be extreme. It can be light. It can be little. Um, but that's why the people are mourning. Even though this is a great day for the Jews in Israel, it's it's a mournful time too. Um, because they're, they're, they're being reminded of their failure, right? So I wanted to point that out. Um, now we can go to chapter um, 4. Okay. So... Ezra chapter four, verse one. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and heads of the father's houses and said to them, let us build with you for we seek your God as you do. And we have sacrificed to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. 
but Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel said to them, You may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded. Okay, so uh, let's go back to four, chapter 4, verse 1. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the cap Activity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said to them, let us build with you for we seek your God as you do. So interesting. Again, verse one says it's their adversaries, guys. And this stuck out to me as I was doing this in my own um, quiet time in my own Bible study that there's going to be people in your life that claim to be Christian, right? It's, it's not a hard thing to say that you're a Christian. And I firmly believe that our nation, America, a lot of Christians are in trouble. Um, it's lip service, right? We, we can all claim that we're all sorts of things and it not be true. And this really sticks out to me in modern day society in America, modern culture, popular belief and this happened to me twice which i it struck me odd each time the holy spirit in me kind of jumped up if you will and it was like this isn't a good sign i asked one girl oh are you christian and she said oh yeah my family's catholic okay and this isn't about catholicism right now this is simply about oh you're christian because your family's catholic no, you're Christian because you believe in Jesus Christ, right? It's your walk with God. You, you can't get into heaven because your family's Catholic. I'm asking you, are you a believer? And needless to say, that relationship didn't work out. Uh, her and I didn't date for very long. And then um, another girl I dated prior to that asked her the same thing one day and was like, hey, are you Christian? And she goes, oh, yeah, my dad goes to insert popular local church here in the city I live. All right. So are you Christian? Oh yeah. My dad goes to so-and-so church. Again, that didn't sit well with me right away. Cause I'm like, I'm not asking you if your dad is a Christian, you know, I'm asking you if you're a Christian. And in these two little examples in my life, I see this theme in a lot of people. A lot of people claim that they're Christian. A lot of people claim that they believe Jesus died and rose again and all that, but their life is not bearing any fruit of that belief. There's this YouTuber I watch, a Christian YouTuber. He puts it perfectly. You cannot earn salvation, all right? The only way you get salvation is you repent and accept Jesus. But when you repent and truly repent and truly accept Jesus, right? You will repent and admit, I am a sinner, God, and I need you to save me. And I believe what you did on the cross. When you truly believe that, there is a transformation that needs to happen or will happen because you are forever changed. When your eyes are open to who God is, he is Jesus. He's a man who came to live with us, like us, experience life as a man. Um, when you start to realize that and your eyes are open to it, you're changed. Okay. So the reason I'm going off on this tangent is because I'm seeing this in American culture a lot. There's still a huge percentage of people that would claim they're Christian or believe in Jesus, but they aren't seeking him daily. They aren't reading the Bible. They aren't getting on their hands and knees daily and saying, God, help me open my eyes, teach me more, show me more. What do you want me to do with my life? What do you want me to do with this day? What are you calling me to do? What are you calling me to stop doing? Do you know what I mean? He becomes the master of your life. And it's a process, okay? It's a process, guys. And we can be patient with ourselves in that process. But we also need to endure and be consistent and, and push and, and, and go after him, you know, daily. So then the Jews say, no, thanks. We don't need your help. Because remember, they're called their adversaries. Oh, that's the second point. I, well, that's what started the whole tangent. You have to be, I don't want to say leery. 
maybe it is leery, but on guard, just because someone comes to you and says they're a Christian, just because somebody has a cross hanging from the rear view mirror in their car, right? Just because someone listens to Christian music does not necessarily mean they're coming into your life to help you. Um, you know, the enemy's a deceiver. What's more cunning if Satan sends someone who is clearly <laughs> antichrist, Satanist, you know what I mean? Like if a Satanist with upside down crosses and I don't make up and Marilyn Manson contacts showed up at your door, knocked on your door and said, Hey, you want to join the church of Satan? Most people are going to think that's weird, even non-believers, because it's like, it's just too obvious, right? That's the obvious game plan. Last time I checked, I don't think uh, Satanists go door to door anyway, like uh, the Mormons. But anyway, so that's a different story. Um, but but the enemy's clever. What's a cl more clever tactic to send someone into your life who is a Christian, who wants to help you, you know what I mean? Who wants to follow the Lord with you? Wh whatever, whatever it is. I'm not saying to discourage that. You know, I pray that God sends you Christian friends, people that are truly Christians who are also your friends that you can get close to, because we do need friends and brothers in this, in this experience, in this spiritual battle. The Bible teaches that the enemy is a deceiver. He deceives us. He comes in the form of an angel of light. And I'm not putting all the blame on the devil, right? The devil has never held a gun to my head and forced me to sin. But it's a combination of my desire to sin or my desire for the dark combined with his deceptive ways that does lead to a a perfect, awful storm. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, he tricks us, but this is why it's so important to seek the Lord. Because as you seek the Lord, you start to get discernment and you can see these things. All right. First time chatter, Parviz. 4314, I have a question. Absolutely. And uh, Parviz, this would be my first question in a Bible study. So that I'm excited as a, as a streamer. It's not trolling. I just want to know, is Jesus God or who is God? Okay, dude. Excellent question. So I assume you're not a Christian. Um, and that's totally fine. But I am. And yes, Christians, we believe that Jesus is God. We, be, we believe in the Trinity. I don't know if you've heard this before or not, but the Trinity, we believe, is God in three parts. And I understand that this is hard for non-believers to understand, right? But we have God, all right? What we all, what we all kind of think of as God, the all-powerful being and creator who made the universe, who's omni- uh, omnipotent he's everywhere at all times he knows everything he knows he's outside of his creation he created the universe and he stands outside of it he knows he hasn't he's not confined to time he's infinite he knows all things jesus uh is god he was conceived of a virgin birth so he's a hundred percent man but he's also a hundred percent um god because he was conceived supernaturally by God, right? He doesn't have a biological earthly father. God put that seed directly in a virgin, okay? And then the Holy Spirit is that same spirit that was in Jesus, the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is what us modern day believers or any believer after Jesus' resurrection, when we come to the, to the Lord, when we come to Jesus, we ask for that spirit to come live in us. Okay, so then who is Jesus? Father, if Jesus is God. But let's see the chat. So Archmages, Parviz, Jesus' dad is God. So in the same way your dad's blood runs through your veins, so does the spirit, the DNA of God through Jesus. I believe this is the way. So I, I came across this just in the last two days. And I believe, you know, this is like an academics description of Jesus. So this isn't the Bible. It's in my Bible as supplemental, supplementary material, but I want to read it. And maybe this will help, maybe, maybe not. But I still think it's thought out very well by some very intelligent writer or group of writers. The word incarnation derives from a Latin word developed from in plus caro, 
flesh, which literally means in the flesh. In Christian theology, the term refers to the supernatural act of God affected by the Holy Spirit, whereby the eternal Son of God, the second person of the triune Godhead, Godhead took into union with himself a complete human nature apart from sin. As a result of that action, the Son of God became the God-man forever, the Word made flesh. The means whereby the incarnation came about is the virginal conception, commonly known as the virgin birth, the miraculous action of the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary, so that what was conceived was fully God and fully man in one person forever. He did this in order to become the Redeemer of the Church, our prophet, priest, and king, and thus to save his people from their sins. By becoming one with us, the Lord of glory not only shares our sorrows and burdens, he is also able to secure our redemption by bearing our sin on the cross as our substitute and being raised for our justification. <clears throat> Biblical evidence for the full deity and humanity of Christ is abundant. In regard to his humanity, Jesus is presented as a Jewish man who was born, underwent the normal process of growth and development, experienced a full range of human experience, including growth in knowledge and the experience of death. Apart from his sinlessness, which scripture unequivocally affirms, he is one with us in every way. Scripture also affirms that the man Christ Jesus is also the eternal son of God and thus God equal with the father and spirit. From the opening pages of the New Testament, Jesus is identified as the Lord, the one who establishes the divine rule and inaugurates the new covenant era in fulfillment of Old, Te Old Testament expectation, something only God can do. That is why Jesus' miracles are not merely human acts empowered by the Spirit of God. Rather, they are demonstrations of his own divine authority over nature satan and his hosts and all things because he is god the son jesus has the authority to forgive sin view his relationship with the father as one of equality and reciprocity and to do the very works of god in creation providence and redemption later church reflection especially at the council of chalcedon affirmed that we cannot do justice to scripture without confessing that jesus of nazareth was fully god and fully man God the Son, who gave personal identity to the human nature he had assumed, and did so without putting aside or compromising his divine nature, must be confessed as one person who, know, now, who now exists in two natures. Additionally, Chalcedon affirmed that we must not think that the Incarnation involved a change in the properties of each nature, so that some kind of blending resulted which was neither divine nor human, <clears throat> as the Yuda Eutychians wrongly affirmed. Rather, we must affirm that the properties of each nature, human and divine, were preserved so that Jesus is all that God is in all of his perfections and all that we humans are except in terms of sin. This affirmation entails at least two important points. First, the man Jesus from the moment of conception was personal by virtue of the union of the human nature in the person of the divine Son. At no point were there two persons or two centers of self-consciousness, as the Nestorians wrong, wrongfully affirmed. That is why in our Lord Jesus Christ we came face to face with God. We meet Him, not subsumed under human flesh, not merely associated with it, but in undiminished moral splendor. The deity and humanity coincide, not because the human has grown into the divine, but because the divine son has taken to himself a human nature for our salvation. He is the divine son who subsists in two natures, who has lived his life for us as our represent, representative head, died our death as our substitute, and been raised for our eternal salvation. This is why the Lord Jesus is utterly unique and without parallel, and thus the only Lord and Savior. Second, since in the Incarnation, the Eternal Son took to himself a human nature, we can now live a fully human life. Yet he was not totally confined to that human nature, as if for a period of time the divine nature was 
divested of its attributes or function. That is why scripture affirms that even as the incarnate one, the divine son continued to uphold and sustain the universe. Even while he lived out his life on earth as a man dependent upon the father and empowered by the spirit. Our affirmation of the biblical Jesus is beyond our full comprehension comprehension but it is only in such a jesus that we have one who can meet our every need apart from him as god the son incarnate we do not have a redeemer who can stand on our own behalf as a man let alone satisfy god's own righteous demand upon us due to our sin after all it, it is only god who can save us by becoming one with us our lord not only becomes our sympathetic savior he also accomplishes a work that saves us fully completely and finally that was a long one, but I think it was appropriate. <clears throat> Parvi, so then how many gods are there? I thought Christianity is one God. He is. He's one God with three different natures or three different persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? God is the eternal spirit. He sent that spirit to live in the form of a man, Jesus when Jesus died, that same spirit, the Holy Spirit, is now available to all of us. This is the best metaphor I've ever heard about how God is. You know how water can be in three forms, right? Water can be a solid. It can be ice. Water can be liquid water. And water can be air or steam, right? It's all water. Steam, ice, and water are all water but they're in three different forms. And to me, that's, that's the best metaphor that helped my mind kind of understand it. It's one God and there's like three different forms of that one God. Archmages, the father, the son, and the Holy spirit are one Parviz, based on what you wrote me on top. There are not person. It's mean there are more than one, how to understand it. Um, I hope the water thing helped. And uh, Parviz, thank you for asking these questions, right? As it said in this explanation, um, our affirmation of the biblical Jesus is beyond our full comprehension, which also makes sense to me. Can any human fully understand everything about God? The one God who created this whole universe, this infinite universe, as far as we know, the, in the universe goes on infinitely. Us men are constrained to time and space. We can't even really wrap our head around what it means to be forever, right? Um, so sometimes I think that struggle of understanding God is, is like it said, I don't know if any human's going to fully comprehend it ex besides Jesus because he was God. I would encourage you, Parviz, to say this one simple prayer. You know, God, Jesus, if you're real, show me who you are and that's it if you have any pulling if you are curious if you feel something in your spirit pulling you i would just ask you to start praying that simple prayer jesus reveal yourself to me god you know jesus if you are god show me and and our god is faithful the bible says that faith starts out as a small mustard seed it's like what the smallest of all the seeds or one of the smallest seeds our faith starts out it just might be that little but that faith grows into one of the biggest trees that shelters birds i'm loving this guys real steve tv bible study uh first question being asked by parviz parviz another question who is evil i think there's evil in us humans when we don't when we don't accept Jesus and God, the, the evilness in us has the potential to grow. Us sinners, this is why us Christians believe in Jesus and God. He saved us from our sin. The Bible says all men are sinners. All of us sin. We've all done something. Have you ever stole something? Have you ever lied? Have you ever looked at a woman lustfully? Have you ever had sex outside of marriage, right? If you've done even one of those things, you're a sinner. You've broken the, the Ten Commandments. So if God is most powerful, one, why he can't fight against evil? Oh, he can fight against evil 
and he fights against evil real well. And that's, that's what this experience called life is. We are seeing the spiritual battle in our world and God is fighting against evil. And what the Bible teaches, when it's all said and done, when the end times come, Jesus Christ is coming back a second time. Remember, Jesus came the first time. The, the pastor at my church said it beautifully. Jesus came merciful as our Savior the first time. The second time he's coming to judge the world as the righteous judge and evil will be defeated once and for all at the second coming of Christ. The girl called him anyone or anything that has free will is capable of evil is capable of going against God. Amen. Archimedes, God does fight against evil. Amen. The girl called him God fights against evil, but we have free will and he will not mess with that. Amen. That's what this being a human is, guys. This is what it is to be a human. This is what it is to live. It wouldn't be life if we didn't have a choice. Archimedes, God wants us to choose his love for ourselves. Amen. Because it is only with free will that we can have true love, which by definition is freely given. Father God, um, Lord, I just lift the parvis to you in the name of Jesus. And... I pray that you reveal yourself to him, Father. We all need you, Lord. And I pray that Parviz's spiritual eyes and ears would be open, Lord God, and that you would reveal yourself to him. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Parviz, I didn't understand, so evil is God. He can control us. Oh, God can do anything he wants to us, right? So if God wants to step in and do something, he can do that because he's the creator of the universe. Um, but like the girl called M said, we have free will. All right. But I do believe God can come in and control things that those are what we call miracles. You know, God's hand can reach through the spiritual veil and do whatever he wants at any given time. You know, um, the Bible says, you know, and that's why I fear God. I love God. I love Jesus, but I'm also, I fear God. And the Bible says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Parviz, evil can control us too. The girl called him good and evil can influence us, but not control us. Ultimately, you, ultimately you have a choice. I, I agree with the girl called him, but here's the thing about sin. Once you keep turning your back on God, sin can get out of control. And you can find yourself in bondage to sin. And you can't just snap your fingers and get out of it by your own human power or your own human will. Trust me, I know this firsthand experience. This is my testimony. I used to be addicted to alcohol. I used to be addicted to marijuana. I've gone from relationship to relationship with women outside of marriage. Um, I chose to. I chose to commit those sins. Nobody forced me. The devil didn't hold a gun to my head and force me to smoke pot every day. The devil didn't force me to go to the liquor store and get drunk every day. The devil didn't hold a gun to my head and make me go from girlfriend to girlfriend having premarital sex. But what I thought would start out as something little that I had control over quickly evolves into something that to some degree, I don't have control over. We see this over and over again in addicts. You see addicts who want to quit, but they can't quit. The evilness has grown very big in their life. And it is takes an act of God to save people. I mean, if you think about, you don't even have to be an ad addict. What Jesus did on the cross was an act of God to save humanity from their sins. Whatever your sin is. Like I said, it doesn't have to be addiction to alcohol or weed or premarital sex. It can be whatever your sin is. He had to send a man to die on a cross for our sins to get us out of the trouble that we're in as, as humans, as individuals and as humanity. All of us humans, we're inclined to love evil and like evil. That's what sin is going against God. It's our own desire inside of us to want to do the wrong thing. Like I said, Parviz, have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen anything? 
Have you had sex outside of marriage? If you've done any of those things, those to God are evil. Lying is evil. Um, stealing is evil. Having sex outside of marriage is evil. Those are just three of the major Ten Commandments, right? And I'm sure the devil didn't hold a gun to your head to make you do any of those things. The Bible says it's, it's our own desire for the dark. All right. And we don't realize what we're playing with when we play with our sin. Back to my testimony. I didn't think I would uh, be a guy who had to check into detox, you know, one day because my sin was so out of control. Now I needed medical help to quit drinking. It was bad. It got bad. Sin is evil. And it's, it's inside all of us. I don't think evil is like a person. You keep saying who is evil. We're evil. <laughs> I prayed before this started that the Holy Spirit would do what he wanted with it. I prepared lightly, like in the sense that I knew what I was going to cover, which things I wanted to hit. I had some supplemental stuff pulled up on the internet to explain things. So I had a vague plan of where I want to go, but I said, Lord, but you you come you speak you guide it you direct it so parviz i don't believe it's a coincidence that you came um i think the lord i think what you're experiencing is curiosity about this and you're questioning and that's a good thing um archmages i appreciate this time to talk about god with you all yes amen arc so do i um parviz i'm going to be doing this every wednesday i encourage you follow me that's for my own selfish reasons don't forget to like subscribe share um but seriously come back every wednesday bro and and like i said parviz start praying jesus if you're real show me that's all you have to start praying parviz and i'm gonna warn you that's a powerful prayer that's a very powerful prayer as simple and little as it is and that goes for any viewer who's questioning anybody who's on the fence anybody who feels like they're being pulled to christ but they're just not sure because it doesn't make sense i highly encourage you to just that small mustard seed of faith just start praying jesus if you're real show me he's a faithful god he died for your sins he wants to open your eyes in your ears to the truth. I promise that. I can promise you that. That's not my promise. That's a promise for, from the Lord. He is faithful. The Bible says, if you seek me, you will find me. That's, that's as simple as I can say. If you seek God, you will find God. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for Parviz. Thank you for Archmages. Thank you for the girl called M. Lord, thank you for anyone who swung by and heard part of it. Thank you for anyone else who's been here watching, viewing. Um, I don't know who, who sees this, God, believer or non-believer. But for all my fellow believers out there, Lord, I pray that you guide them, protect them, encourage them, strengthen, strengthen them, inspire them, motivate them, Lord God. We are living during challenging times, Lord. Our lives, our individual lives can be challenging at times. And everything that we're seeing going on in our respective nations, states, provinces, cities, towns, communities, there's a lot of stress um, being put on the world right now, Lord. And I believe this is a crossroads for a lot of people in their faith, right? right? This is a time of People are going to turn their back on you and abandon you and say, there is no God. Why would he let this happen? And other people are going to, they're going to see, oh, there is a God. And everything that you ordained, everything in, in the scriptures, all the prophecies, they're coming true, Lord. Um, and I pray for my fellow believers for protection and endurance and stamina, that they keep seeking you, Father, day in and day out getting on their knees every day, repenting of their sins that they're struggling with, asking for forgiveness, dusting, you know, the dust off their clothes, getting back up and trying again, Lord, and seeking you. And for all the non-believers or the people who are on the fence or people who used to believe or grew up Christian and now they don't believe, Lord, I just pray that you give them the, the, the courage to pray that simple prayer. Jesus, if you're real, show me. Like I said, 
the Bible says, not like I said, the Bible says, if you seek me, you will find me. And you're faithful in that, Father God. All we have to do is seek, Lord, and you reveal yourself. You revealed yourself to us. The Bible also says everyone knows there's a God. It's evident in, in nature, the stars, the sun, the moon. You created this universe, Lord, and we all kind of know that deep, deep in our spirit. This was not a random accident. There's a purpose to this, Lord. Use this video um, on YouTube. Use you use anything from here for your glory god let it go out into the world let this come across the people who need to hear it let let them be encouraged and inspired father and uh, we just thank you for another another day in jesus name we pray amen <laughs>